Jay. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consultant. Jay Shear. Jay Shear Business Consulting. Hey everybody, I'm Jay Shear with Jay Shear Business Consulting. We help entrepreneurs and business owners maximize their potential, build rock solid businesses, and create more freedom in their lives. And you've joined Business Minds Coffee Chat. According to a Deloitte survey of 1,000 full-time workers across different sectors in the U.S., 77% had experienced burnout at their current job, with more than half having experienced it more than once. On today's episode, we're going to talk about burnout and mental health, the importance of opening the conversation around mental health and well-being, psychological safety, performing at our best, and more. Our guest is a husband and father of two, a record-setting world champion powerlifter, a leader in the field of health and performance in the workplace, and has had a 14-year career at Google developing, launching, and scaling global programs aimed at helping Googlers, that's employees who work at Google for the rest of us, to thrive. On top of all of that, he's also a break dancer. <laughs> Please welcome. Google's Director of Health and Performance, Newton Chang. Newton, thank you so much for being here today. It is truly wonderful to see you. Jay, very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. It is absolutely my pleasure. And I, I just want to share with you before we jump into the conversation that researching you and learning more about who you are, not only the type of work that you do, but some of your philosophy, the way that you think, the way that you show up to the world, your authenticity, the, the videos that you've put out, your writings. It has really been an insightful exploration for me. And I, I just want to share that with you because I'm, I'm, that adds to my excitement in the conversation that we're going to have today. So with all that said, let's jump right in. I, I would love it if first you would share with us what your favorite trait is about yourself. Hmm. I want to say sense of humor, but actually what's coming up for me right now is my ability to obsess on a topic. So if I think about what has helped me through some difficult situations in life, like work or, you know, trying to achieve certain things or helped me to really learn deeply, not just about a topic or myself. It's that, um, like as a kid, you know, everyone, all of us were playing video games. I didn't realize all the rest of my friends were just kind of having fun. And I was playing the game to beat it, you know, on the hardest mode possible without move, losing a life. And I thought we were all doing that. So I was playing obsessively down to the detail. And then I would go play competitively against my friends and I would kick the crap out of them. And I real I, I didn't know like, oh, you're not playing the game this way. And so I don't do that about everything. But when I choose something like so, for example, uh, you mentioned I was a break dancer. Uh, I remember I, I didn't learn how to spin on my head till I was 30, which is pretty late for a break dancer. And I remember... I said, I'm going to get this. And at some point, I, my head felt weird and I reached up there and I was bleeding because I had been practicing so much. And so whether this was applied to, you know, something like break dancing, I apply it to powerlifting now. I used to do it for brewing beer. Um, I use it definitely. I've used it in academics and in the workplace. It kind of gets me through the pedestrian period of learning a skill and then all the really good stuff happens when you're taking it things a little too far and you look around and the friends you started with they've already quit because they're like you've gone too far with this and now you got to ask why am i still going and what's worth learning all the way down the road here so let's tug on that thread for a moment because i'm, I'm curious obsessing on a topic you gave a, a, a good example there from your youth and I know that 
I, I also can obsess about certain things and I am just relentless about going after something and sometimes to the point where others would have just stopped months ago or even longer, I just keep going. So based on that being a trait of yours, speak to both the, well, you addressed the, the positive side of that, but maybe you could, could give a little clarification on how that has been beneficial to you, and then maybe speak to the dark side of obsessing on a topic as well, and what you've done yourself when you experience that dark side, how do you either use that to empower yourself or what have you learned about throttling back? Yeah. So on this topic of obsession and then going too far down the road, uh, I really like this quote from this book called the book of five rings, which if you read at the most surface level, it's basically like an old philosophy handbook on Japanese sword fighting by an author named Miyamoto Musashi. Um, but if you look into it and you reflect on what he's saying, there's just layers and layers of life lessons there. And so one of the things he talks about is the concept of knowing 10,000 things by knowing one thing well. And so now if I look at powerlifting, where I'm now, um, I'm a master's world champion, I hold a uh, multiple national state records, world records, and I'm still going, there's still more to achieve. There's so much I've learned by continuing to apply. So um, you may have heard athletes saying like, oh, at, at the top level, it's all mindset. And uh, it's absolutely true, but you don't know that until you've gotten that far down the road and working harder or just putting in, you know, just lifting more weights, that's not going to get you further. And so you have to think about how do I want to think differently about this activity to get to the next level? And so one, one example is um, when I tell people that I'm a competitive power lifter and I'm a world champion, they say, oh, you must work out like four hours a day. And I tell them, no, actually you can't do that. So there's a concept called maximum recoverable volume. And this is something I've, I've taken into the workplace as I've struggled with mental health and I realize sometimes I need to throttle back is you just have a natural limit. And that is the maximum uh, volume of work that you can do before which you have to take time to recover from it. And so my maximum recoverable volume, it is what it is. Like I can optimize sleep, I can optimize nutrition, but after that, it's probably genetics. So then after that, you have to think, well, I can't put in more work. So from here, it's all about working smarter and using the bandwidth that I have uh, more optimally. And that's all you can do. And so that's where the positive side, where what I learned in powerlifting, I now have to do the same thing in the workplace, having gone on mental health leave, going through burnout, and now having to really manage my capacity so I can be at my best for my family primarily, and then those I serve in the workplace. Um, that's that's one of those things where by knowing one thing well, you you learn ten thousand other things. Wow, that's that's incredible. That could open up uh, a, a very interesting conversation, which I, I want to touch on. But I also want to mention to our audience that is either watching or listening right now that if you follow Newton on Instagram, you will see a post from him, I would say what Newton, maybe weekly of you training, you working out, you pushing those limits. And it's really interesting to watch your, your progression and how you challenge yourself. And you, you do a great job of not only the video work, but also outlining what you were able to achieve during that training session. So is that something that you continue to to do? I, I believe the last time I looked, maybe the most recent video was just a, a few days ago or a week ago. Yep. I am posting about two to three times a week. It's basically my training log where I track what is the most important work I did during a session. And then what did I learn from that work? And so I, th I think it's two things. It, it's 
kind of just ongoing notes. So I, I remember what I was learning along the way and I can keep refining that. But if you look at it as a body of work, it's the most boring body of work ever, but it's the most real representation of like, what does it take to be a world champion? And it's this guy who, despite having a busy job, a wife and two kids, locks himself in the garage several hours a week, just lifting weights and trying to do it better. And that's it. Like everyone else decided I'm not going in the garage anymore, uh, except for me. So I am world champion. And that's pretty much it. So I want to give just a sidebar note here because I know that uh, that you have competed at the Arnold, what used to be called the Arnold Classic. Um, I'm mm-hmm. not quite sure what the name of it is now, but I used to go to the Arnold Classic. I was living in Ohio for about 10, 11 years, and I used to take some of my sales team to the Arnold Classic in Columbus, Ohio each year. And it, you know, the, the one thing that always stood out to me was the power and ability of the human body and of the human mind to be able to do remarkable things, to be able to push the limits. And there was so much work involved in getting to that level, but it really was a remarkable event to see and to be around so many people who were so highly focused, who just were very goal-oriented and had everything dialed in from nutrition, physical, mental, etc. So I, of course, never competed. I, I do maintain a healthy lifestyle. I work out every day, but not at that level, but I absolutely appreciated it. Yeah, I, I think uh, it, it's now called the the Arnold Sports Festival um, because it encompasses, it, it, you know, I think it grew from around bodybuilding because that's that's Arnold. And now it encompasses many sports. The, the oddest of which I saw were competitive slap fighting, um, which is basically two very large people stand on other, either side of a table and they get to take free shots slapping each other as hard as they can. And these are up to 350 pound, very muscular men. And they keep going until one submits or someone is knocked out cold and you cannot defend yourself. It is one of the most tense, horrifying things I have ever seen. I can see why it's become popular to be watched on the internet. Uh, I never want to see it live again because it was just too much for me. But um, so you you have those things there. But to to what you were saying, I think the um, the thing that draws me back to powerlifting and to other other competitive sports like um, fitness oriented sports like bodybuilding is, you know, the, you have the competitions at the world level. The most fun ones for me are the local level where I get to see someone who's a beginner get up on the platform, hit their goals. And when they went on the the platform, they were unsure of themselves. And when they walk off, just having lifted, you know, deadlifted 300 pounds, let's say, they walk off knowing I am a strong person. And getting to see that happen over and over, that transformation is magical. That, that is quite remarkable. And, and to that point around identity and beliefs and being able to transform and what that takes, what is something that you believed about yourself early on in life that you found out later wasn't true? One hard one for me is... So I had mentioned I I went on mental health leave in January 2022. And what that was, was it was manifesting as uh, clinically depression and anxiety that would kind of come in rolling waves. And I was just perpetually exhausted and irritable, which meant I was really not proud of how I was showing up as a husband and father. And so my belief was that we just went through the pandemic This was a hard and stressful time for all of us. And, you know, it was uh, affecting for me as a leader in the workplace, having to take on additional responsibilities. As I went through therapy and as I went through journaling and self-reflection, what I learned was I've probably been experiencing depression and anxiety since at least my teens. And I didn't have the self-awareness or vocabulary 
or maybe the courage to acknowledge and recognize that's what that was. And so I, I may have been struggling with my mental health for m- most of my adult life, but I was raised very much in the school of mental toughness and grit. So you, not only was I not ref- doing the reflection to recognize that, like I wasn't even missing a heartbeat to consider that that might be going on. Like, nope, I am fine. Time to go. What's next? And uh, yeah, so that that is changed kind of like the whole lens towards my upbringing and my early adulthood. Well, thank you for for sharing that. And that does open up a, a conversation here and a couple of doors that I think are important that we not only open, but that we walk through. And I, I'm, I'm curious, you, you know, you mentioned about feeling like you weren't showing up as your best self, as the best husband and father that you could be. And you also mentioned the words self-awareness, which I I think is critical and key in all of this because there has to be the self-awareness first in order for us to take some sort of next step so we can resolve whatever the issue is, or at least begin to work on it and acquire the tools to help us move through that. So what was it for you? What was the, that catalyst moment was a, uh, was a mirror held up to you? When did you fully realize and how did you fully realize that you weren't showing up the way that you knew you could or should? I think there was, I'll talk about like a progression and then I'll talk about a key moment. And so if I think back to before I had kids, it was just my wife and I, we were, we were very busy. She also works in technology. So if she's tired and irritable, I'm tired and irritable, but we're staying roughly on the same page and taking good enough care of each other, then you can get pretty far without realizing that maybe something might be off, might be wrong or unsustainable. Once I had a kid, like the priorities become clear pretty quick. Like there is a kid who needs you, not just for survival, but for love. And in any given moment, um, I could choose like, where am I going to spend my energy? Is it going to be at work? Is it going to be in powerlifting? Or is it going to be to make sure that when um, my child, who uh, my older child, she's she is pure electricity and joy. She is the most wonderful person in the world. She can really tire me out. <laughs> and when enough days in a row, especially at the beginning of the pandemic where we had lost childcare, happened in a row where I hit my limit and I snapped at her or I was disengaged um, or, you know, other things like where I was just irritable with her and all she wanted was love. Like that is a really harsh mirror to look into. It makes it clear really quick. Like, Hey, you did great at that presentation today. How did you do at playing with your daughter? It was like a plus for the presentation, C minus for playing with your daughter. And so the key moment, Uh, or one key moment was I was in a video meeting with my, uh, my VP or my vice president's um, team. And we were just going around and like, we're all in our little thumbnails. We use Google meet, not zoom. But so on Google meet, we're going through the thumbnails and everyone's answering the check-in. How are you doing? And I don't know why, but when it got to me, uh, I just felt compelled to be a little more real. And before the words came out, I started crying and I said, the number of days that I'm showing up, uh, that I'm proud of how I'm showing up as a father is going down and I don't know how to turn that trend around. And it just kind of came out. I had to hear it and I, I didn't know what to do with it after that, but something was clearly wrong. So you, had this experience, identified that something was clearly wrong. You made a decision to take a mental health leave. 
And what was the next step for you? And what I'd like to explore a bit, Newton, is when you decided to go into therapy, if you could share some of the takeaways, some of the learnings that came through that, some of the things you learned about yourself through that process. Sure. So I'll, first I'll offer a timeline because it wasn't like that happened and then I knew I had to go and leave. That's where I started to get really scared that something was wrong. But I went to old habits of put your head down, grind harder, start meditating, fix your sleep, you know, fix all the lifestyle behaviors that you can. And so that was, I think that meeting um, where I started crying in front of my team was summer of 2020. I didn't first start th seeing the therapist until April of 2021. And that was what happened was I was increasingly struggling to get out of bed. February 2020, 2021 was the first time I felt like I physically couldn't get out of bed because I was just paralyzed by this sense of dread. And so at that point, when I was finally able to get out of bed, it was clear I got to go get help. And so I used our employee assistance provider, um, found a therapist, and he told me what I was exhibiting was early signs of burnout. Now, I think what happened after that was by fall of 2021, I had found a new therapist and he told me that I was exhibiting major symptoms of depression and anxiety. And we hadn't really used those terms yet in, in my journey. And so I was kind of surprised and I told him like, wait, I have no history of mental health issues. Um, I thought this is just what it feels like to work really hard. And he said, well, yes, it is, but it is also depression and anxiety. And so I was diagnosed as what's, uh, with what's called high functioning depression, where, yeah, I, I was pretty depressed at times. I also had systematized my life so that even if I wasn't fully functional cognitively, even if I wasn't really emotionally engaging, I could get stuff done and appear as if I was. And so by that point, that's where I started talking to him and he was saying, you may want to consider going on leave. I hadn't turned around some of you know my issues around just not being uh, the husband and father I wanted to be. And so that was where I started planning like, okay, um, I need to go on leave. And we started like working through the, the logistics and timing of it. Now, while on leave, I think what I thought was going to happen was I rest for a week and then I go through all these self-help books and I do all the exercises and I journal really aggressively. An epiphany happens. I start thinking differently about life and then I come back all re-energized. Um, I tried to do that for like a week and it was clear like, okay, no, this is not going to get me there. So then I started just giving myself space. Like you're going to do nothing. Like, go hike up this hill and just stare at Silicon Valley. And I did that some days. Um, and then once I did that, I felt like my, my nervous system started to ramp down. And I started to just kind of get enough peace and quiet that I could start to, I, I don't know what the right term for it is, but like feel like myself again. And once I kind of started to have a sense of that, I wanted to lean into that. So I actually reconnected with two friends, one who's known me since junior high and one who uh, I was good friends with in my 20s, or that's when we first became friends. And it was really interesting to talk to people who kind of knew me before I had filled out my resume and achieved all this stuff and become a leader at Google. And I could just reconnect with like, yeah, who was who was Newton back in his teens? Uh, who was Newton in his 20s when he didn't know what the heck to do with his life? Um, but he had values and he had principles driving him. Um, and he you know, had things that brought him joy. And so what I saw was 
one, I, I think I was able to reconnect with some of those things. But then two, it brought up this question of what is fueling this machine that made you try to achieve all that stuff? Because you weren't talking about that in your 20s. And when I really started to look into it, and that was via journaling, it was via feedback from those friends, um, it was via therapy, what I found was I probably had some traumatic experiences with bullying as a kid. Um, and my reaction to that, the human mind is complex, so this is just the best narrative I've been able to piece together. My reaction to that is that I exhibit characteristics of what's called people pleasing. And that is like, I will put someone else's needs ahead of mine um, in order to keep them happy or to appease them. And I had told myself for a long time that I'm just a helpful, warm person. And I am. But then there were times where, honestly, I was doing that not out of love or out of aspiration, but from fear and anxiety, like fears of not belonging, fears of not being accepted, um, you know, fears that probably came from, from that bullying where the person, you know, who bullied me, like I really looked up to, and then they, to, to child Newton, it really felt like this person turned on me and I never wanted that to happen again. So I better please people. And so once I could see that, that, that machine's still there and it, it still wins the day sometimes, but I know it's there and I can call it out more often and choose a different path. One that's based around what are my aspirations? You know, what am I doing out of love versus out of survival or fear? So what were then some, you talked about reconnecting with people that you had been friends with who could help you or at least connect with who Newton was before all of this. And that helped to also give some clarity. What were some of the tools that you were provided that helped you start to understand where this was potentially coming from and identifying, let's say, the people-pleasing aspect and the fact that you more than likely were consistently emptying your cup to be able to do for others, but there was no bandwidth left for you. So two major, I'll say first, first the reconnecting with the friends. One thing that an aha for me was th they did say some pretty important stuff that I needed to hear. The more important thing was to just be with them where they created space for me. I had no agenda and I could just kind of reconnect with who was I back when we spent all that time together in, in our youth. And that's, that's still in there. There's this um, uh, phrase or, or a quote from an, a writer, Madeline, Madeline L'Angle, and it is, I am every age I've ever been. And so, you know, you don't grow out of something. It's kind of like you grow on top of it and then you grow the next layer and you grow the next layer. And so it was like, ah, yeah, that's there. Let's go back down to the foundation. And, and my friends didn't have to tell me that. Like, I could just be with them and reconnect with it. So that's one thing. Now, two specific tools that I used. One, uh, I believe this type of therapeutic work, it's called Wounded Child, where you really try to think back to what went on at key moments when you were a kid. And, you know, you might think about, like, the, the bullying I had gone through. I used to think of it as just like, no, 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 that's kids being kids. And then one of my friends who I reconnected with said, yeah, you know, if you uh, ever went to therapy or now that you're going to therapy, the thing I always wanted you to dive into was that relationship because you, that would come up and it sounded pretty traumatic. And what I realized was I was minimizing it. I was just saying like, you know, that's kids being kids. I got over it. But that's not really how it works because when I experienced it, I was four, I was five, I was six. Kids don't have that type of perspective. Like it is catastrophic to them to, to have someone turn on them like that. And I had to reconnect with that. And it was interesting, like those feelings, like it was a long time ago, those feelings are still there. 
and I could see how they might be manifesting today. And that was, that was really, really hard to look at, but it was really, really necessary. So that is one thing. Now, something that works more in the moment for me, it's a process called The Work by an author named Byron Katie. And it's this really, really simple, straightforward questioning process to just examine your own thoughts to see is your, is your brain getting into a negative spin cycle? And the question is like, okay, first list out your negative thought. The first question is, is it true? Second question is, do you have proof that it is definitely true? Third question is, when you have this thought, who are you being? And then the fourth question is, without this thought, who would you be? And then the last step is like, knowing that, can you reframe this into uh, a different story? And so I started doing that every morning, dumping out. I, I didn't know how many negative thoughts were spinning in my head right from waking, but I'd, I'd probably have 10 I could list out. I'd pick my top three because I didn't want to spend all day just doing that. Um, I would debug those. And then I'd go through the day just a little more clear headed and with uh, love with its hand on the steering wheel instead of fear. Beautiful. That's a powerful process. And I'm curious, are you, what, what is the mechanism today that helps you the most in being able to pay attention to those thoughts? So you are as quickly as possible recognizing them before getting into that swirl. I think it is, it's two things. It's those questions. I've kind of internalized them so I can run the process um, internally quickly. But step one for me is mindful breathing, even just 10 breaths. So if I can take a step back and I recognize like, okay, the, the negative spin cycle, it's going, I take a step back, 10 breaths. Now run the four questions. Like why are we, wh what is the negative spin cycle? Name it, do the four questions, reframe it, move forward. Interesting. I found, and you, you mentioned about meditation a couple moments ago, I, I found that meditation for me helped me at least recognize when those thoughts arrive and then learning the tools of what to do with that, which the process that you just described with the work, I think those are very powerful questions to ask because it allows for a reset. It allows to stop in the moment to really think through those thoughts and we're looking for the truth. And I found, I don't know if this is something that you found as well, but most of those negative thoughts that I have and that I still have today aren't rooted in truth. There, there may be a component of those thoughts that is picking up on something that happened. But of course, then the story that I tell myself continues to grow and grow. And I'm trying to tie different or connect dots together that aren't meant to be connected. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I feel like we've um, now, now, you know, having worked in the health and well-being space and having to work uh, do that work in a company where we're trying to tie it to things like how do we be better, you know, as teammates, as leaders, you know, in our personal lives, there's, there's a conversation of how that affects performance. And so I feel like if you, if we brought this up 10 years ago, we would talk about this through a neuroscience lens and say, yeah, that's your reptilian brain. It is there to find the threats, call them out and have you on alert. And just know what that is, because you don't need to have it on alert. The evolution I see now, which I think is a very, very good one, is we go a step beyond that to talk more about the human experience and say, and it is okay to struggle. It is okay to feel those fears. And if you're willing to open up and name those, you don't have to carry those alone. So give us an, an example, if you will, of 
naming those fears and opening those conversations and how you would apply that in the workplace, in the work that you do today? So one of the things that I am very conscious to do is when someone is talking about my leave out of, I think, respect for my privacy, they will often call it a sabbatical. And the first thing I do is reframe it back to like, that was a mental health leave because I want people to hear that. And so that is one thing where I'm like, okay, you know, like we're sabbatical can mean many things. And it's very innocuous. Mental health leave comes with a different connotation. I want you to know I went there because I know many of you may need to go there too. And as I've done that, and as I've named things like mental health leave, um, I don't say I went on mental health leave because I was overworked. I say I did it because I was ashamed of how I was showing up as a husband and father. As I do that, and people see this message, I get so many private messages about people saying, thank you, I really needed to see that because I felt alone. Or thank you, seeing this made me realize I'm not in a good place and I probably need to do something. And then even more striking is, on average, about one person per week now reaches out to me. And this is not just within Google, but this is beyond Google, other employers like Google, uh, who just want to talk and say, hey, I saw your post. I think I might need to go on leave too. I don't even know how to have this conversation. And then even if I have that conversation, like, I don't know how to navigate the system. Like, it, it's a, a very interesting system to, to take short-term disability if that's the direction you'd go to take the mental health leave. And so that's, that's like one of the examples of what I'm trying to name, but like the feedback loop, the positivity or, or the positive opportunity it's creating for others, it's not just like it happens sometimes. It happens every time I share. So I keep doing it. So I'll share with you that as I was researching you and in really delving as deeply as I could into your work. You're very active on LinkedIn. That's one of the platforms that you're active on. And Newton, I saw a shift in the way that you post, the type of post that you curate. And to echo what you just said, when you when I saw a shift occur and you were being very transparent, very open, speaking from the heart, n no filter, it was just you sharing, the number of responses of people who were so appreciative of what you were providing and it really began, it resonated with me and it said, this is what opening the conversation looks like. This is why we, whether it's leadership in the workplace, whether it's leadership at home in our personal professional lives, why we need authenticity and to be more open about not only the challenges that we face, but how we are working through that. And you know, you mentioned about the private messages that you've received. There are a plethora of public responses, obviously, that you receive as well. How does that, how does that make you feel knowing that you're having that type of impact on other people's lives? I'll say every time I share, it, I am still quite nervous. Like I was socialized to not share this. Like I was, I was raised with a very small vocabulary around emotions. Um, I didn't have people in my life um, modeling what it looked like to be open and vulnerable about hard feelings. And so every time I do it, I, I was explaining to someone, it's actually easier to do on LinkedIn than it might be to do on a podcast because I can just type it up and hit post and then go hide and check it later. If I have to do this with with Jay, like we have to connect as humans, and that opens the opportunity for rejection, like Jay going like, 
oh my gosh, like what's wrong with you? You went through all that, like get it together, man. Not that you did that, but there, there's that lingering fear because that's how I was socialized. Um, I think the other thing it makes me feel is, is determined because what I see is no one has ever told me, oh my God, that is the most amazing story. What they have told me is I very much appreciate you being vulnerable. So my belief is it has nothing to do with my story or me. It has all to do with a seeing a real human act of vulnerability that a lot of us are, are hurting for right now. And then to the way I like to piece this together is like, if we want change to happen, especially in our organizations, you were saying many entrepreneurs listen to you, like hopefully they'll, they'll build the next Google. Um, many small businesses listen to you. I think that's the best place for this message to get out because small businesses employ the majority of the country here in the US. And so the vulnerability, that opens the possibility for real true connection. That connection is what opens the possibility for hard conversations about the stuff we all know we need to talk about around mental health. That connection enables those conversations to happen. And when we can have the hard conversation, that's when change and transformation will happen, both in ourselves and in the organizations in which, in which we live and work. So to that point, Newton, where, where do you believe that begins? Does that always begin at the top culturally with the leadership of the organization? And in answering that question, if you find that if there's a, a, a listener or a viewer right now who is working for another company, not their own, another company where they don't feel they can have these types of conversations, where they don't have the psychological safety to be able to open up that type of dialogue, they don't know who to turn to, what suggestion would you make to them if you speak directly to that individual right now who's listening? What would you say to them? I would say I always anchor to the quote from Arthur Ashe, um, who was a Wimbledon tennis player and um, a civil rights activist. And he said, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. And so some of us, depending on where you're at in an organization or where you are at in society, you may have more power and more privilege. And so I think more of the onus goes to you to drive positive change. However, all of us have something. So the thing I try to be very careful with people um, to, to, to try to nudge them in this direction, not everyone's ready to hear this, but the direction I try to get them to start thinking is everyone has some power. Everyone has some privilege. Focus on what you can do because the moment you focus on all the stuff you can't do, you've given away all your agency to make things better. So from there, now, if you can focus on what you can do, uh, there's a few things. So if you believe me that it all starts with vulnerability, the only thing blocking you from being vulnerable is a bit of courage. And if you can get over that step, what that might look like to share just a little bit more is there's an author named Carol Robin. Um, she wrote the book Connect, and it's based on a course she taught at Stanford called Touchy Feely. Uh, it, it, it has a more scientific actual name, but the nickname is Touchy Feely. And it gets people uh, to understand their emotions and be aware of how it affects their mindsets and how they show up. And the thing she says is use the 15% rule. So when you show up in a situation and you want to try to see if it's comfortable to be a little more vulnerable, think of it first as a small experiment. And for that small experiment, think, if I just went 15% beyond my comfort zone into what she calls the zone of learning, what would I say? So an example is I was on a call with, um, it was a training course. And so it was me and 50 other Google directors. So pretty high level, you know, um, key people for the company. And we were sharing about some key insight. And I was about to say it made me uncomfortable. And then I thought, 
let's go 15%. What, what would I say? Cause uncomfortable is a really un- innocuous word. It doesn't mean anything, or at least when I say it, it, it doesn't mean anything. And so what came out was I said, it made me feel sad. And then what I saw after that was later on, I, I don't know if my sharing had this effect, but other people would use words like, yeah, I saw that thing and I was scared. I was terrified. And now once we've started naming those things, we can take a deeper look at what is going on there with ourselves and then the system in which we're interacting and what do we want to be different. So that's where I would say is, you know, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can, starts with vulnerability. And then if you can try the 15% rule, if you just want to take a baby experiment, you don't have to do it all in one big swing. I love that. That is so, so good. And by the way, Arthur Ashe was from my hometown, Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> that's amazing. It is amazing. And that's a great quote, by the way. That's a quote that I think about often. So thank you for sharing that. I know that's going to help a lot of people that are listening today. So Newton, there are so many other areas that I would love to explore with you. We will have to set up round two because I want to be respectful of your time. I do want to ask you a couple of questions though, as we wrap up our conversation. One would be, please share with our audience where they can connect with you and where they can consume your incredible content and be able to read some of those posts that you might be nervous about hitting the send button, but you do anyway. So for those posts, uh, the, the nervous posts are all on LinkedIn. And so search my name, Newton, just spell it like you would Isaac Newton, N-E-W-T-O-N. Chang is not with an A, it is with an E, C-H-E-N-G. Now, if you want to see the boring posts of me just lifting weights in my garage, that is on Instagram. Um, some people are into that. Uh, if you are, you're part of my tribe, and uh, there's no shame in that. Beautiful. Well, we will certainly link to your social handles on the podcast notes. And here is my final question to you. What is the most difficult decision that you've had to make in the pursuit of the person who you've become? I'm trying to think about somewhere in the process of either going on leave or coming back from leave, I feel like an old part of me had to die. I think, so I talk often about my three-legged stool and that's how I prioritize my life. And so there's three legs. There is um, my role as a husband and father, my role as a competitive powerlifter, and my role as a leader at Google. I am incredibly passionate about the work I do at Google and the, just generally the work I'm trying to do within health and well-being. And so the vision for my team at Google, as well as the vision for my career, is to create a culture of well-being that inspires people around the world to take care of themselves and each other. And for me, I could spend the rest of my life working on that and trying to make that better and feel like I had lived a full life. The hard decision I had to make was to say that comes in third on the third legged stool. Family comes first, powerlifting comes second, because if I do that well, I have to live all the good lifestyle behaviors. And leader at Google, even though they're paying the paycheck, even though I am so passionate about our vision, that has to come in third. Well said. If I had asked you that same question prior to the birth of your children, how would you have answered it? I would have said all the legs of the stool are equal because I don't think I honestly knew what would happen when they got out of balance. And now I know what happens and it's clear they are not equal. Self-awareness. Amazing. Yes. Newton, thank you so very much for spending time with us today on Business Minds Coffee Chat. I am so grateful to you for sharing, for bringing your true self 
true self to our conversation for being authentic and sharing your insights and wisdom. Thank you so very much. Jay, thank you for creating the opportunity. Um, thank you for creating the space. I really enjoyed the conversation and I am totally up for round two. Excellent. I appreciate that. And for all of you, thank you so very much for watching and for listening. And would you please do us a favor? Would you take a moment to subscribe, rate, and please leave us a comment? Let us know what you thought about this episode, what resonated most with you. And to enjoy more episodes, all you need to do is visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com slash podcast. And until next time, keep learning, keep growing, and we'll see you on the next Business Minds Coffee Chat. Take care, everybody. Jay. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consultant. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consulting. 